welcome at the Beyond Borders talk show. My name is Rix Herklotz and I'm the director of The Next Women. And I'm joined here today by Cherk Opmeer, director of international programs at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Cherk, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, so today we'll have an array of guests. We have four female entrepreneurs joining us to tell, uh, to tell us a little bit more about their international enterprise and how they handle their business overseas and what borders mean to them. Welcome the guests today, Melanie Ribak, founder of Radically Open Security. Welcome. Thank you. And Jalila Asaid, uh, you're the founder of Inspider and also the Bio Art Lab. Welcome. Thank you average of international entrepreneurs, what's the number? I think around 12% of the entrepreneurs are, are international, but it depends a little bit on the, on the way you calculate. Uh, but it, it's steadily growing. And of course, from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, uh, we're trying to help uh, together with the different partners uh, to have uh, Dutch entrepreneurs go abroad. And we have an array of, uh, of different instruments. We can help with uh, networks, we can help with information, we can help with finance, we can help with uh, well, what we call troubleshooting or uh, making sure that when you're in a country, you want to be active, that you could be helped by either us or people from the different uh, embassies and other, uh, the whole embassy network. So I think that's, uh, that's very good. And in, in that sense, we can try to help a little bit to get those figures up. <laughs> Yeah, and great. And to talk a little bit more about that with us are these uh, two uh, ladies here. Melanie, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what Radically Open Security does and uh, how your experience has been uh, as an international entrepreneur so far? Yeah. So Radically Open Security is a social enterprise in the computer security consultancy space. So we have about 40 ethical hackers, and uh, we've worked for a very wide range of customers, ranging from Google to the European Union <laughs> to uh, tiny NGOs and nonprofits uh, and everything in between. We've had more than 100 customers. Um, yeah, and we are a... a what I call a post-growth company, which is a little bit funny. It means that uh, we are actually giving our profits to charity. So we actually have given more than uh, 250,000 euros in six and a half years' time to the NLNet Foundation, which then supports, uh, it's an internet-related charity. So Amazing, oh. amazing. And Jalila, for you, what is Inspider? <laughs> what is BioArt Lab? What are all the great things you're doing? Yeah, so for me, it's very important um, to have and a profit company and a non-profit. So Inspire is uh, based on profit and it's still a startup. So it uh, has, for example, Mastic, a transformation of cow manure in new uh, um, materials for the industry, for the textile industry, for example. It has uh, the spider silk with human skin cells to create a new skin crafts uh, for the medical industry. And we buy our laboratories, which is a non-profit. We focus on international talent development on the crossover between biotech and creative industries. So creating these new innovative ideas like Mastic or uh, the spider silk. So what are your ambitions when it comes to doing business on an international level? That's always a funny question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I really try and focus upon the value that I'm providing, uh, whether it's value to our customers, value to the staff members we work with, and value to society. When people ask me, you know, where do you see yourself in five to ten years, my typical answer is actually, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because if I focus on that, I'm not going to be providing, you know, the, the best service to anybody, you know, that I'll be able to uh, to provide. So, so that's really it. I mean, I don't have growth ambitions, but ironically enough, through the lack of growth ambitions, we've actually grown quite quickly. But do, do you also have international uh, contacts and, and things you do international actively? I suppose, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we, we have been working uh, with all kinds of parties. I mean, as I mentioned before, we're a preferred supplier for uh, Google, mm -hmm. uh, also Mozilla, the Open Tech Fund in the Uni United States. Uh, we're currently testing a COVID-19 uh, contact tracing app, so the Corona Melder here in the Netherlands, but also via the European Commission. We're testing the Google Apple uh, Exposure Notification Framework, the Interoperability API. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how, did they, how did they find you? Because you, you came to to the Netherlands 20 years ago, you studied here, uh, you started your, your company here, yes. and then? You know, we started by focusing on the Dutch market, and to be quite honest, I'm still primarily focused on the Dutch market, but I think if you can make your market very, very, very happy, <laughs> 
people talk, you know, and, and certainly with customers like Google, you know, you don't go looking for Google, you know, they, they know where to find you. <laughs> so, you know, and I think in general, that's a pretty sound principle <laughs> anyhow, uh, for, uh, for marketing. I mean, if you just make your customers incredibly happy and you provide true social value, customers go looking for you. And that's, I think how much we've, how we've expanded internationally so quickly. So I, guess I think also you don't need help from the government in, in whatever sense because people come to you because they need your product, so to say. Well, of course, I mean, government uh, assistance is beneficial. I mean, uh, the RVO, you know, the Dutch Enterprise Agency has, uh, for example, we just participated uh, in February in a uh, trade mission uh, to the RSA conference in San Francisco. Okay. Uh, you all gave me a wonderful podium uh, to be able to tell our story, uh, you know, several times at some of the embassies and some other events. And it was incredibly valuable because, of course, the more people hear our story and the more we can profile ourselves, the more folks know that we exist and that we have a value proposition. Uh, so, of course, the ability to be able to tell our story, you know, we need to pr preach to our choir before they realize they're choir members. So, <laughs> You know, in that sense, I mean, I think the government can very much help. Okay. And okay. Did, did RVO come to you or did you have to come to the Netherlands Enterprise Agency? Uh, in this particular case, the RVO came to us. And how's it been for you, Jalila? I really, I'm listening to Melanie's story and I find it very cool and interesting because she's one of the companies I just know now that is not focused on the on the profit side, but it's looking at different values. And for me, the uh, the um, other values are more important than just the economical. It's it's about having a sustainable company or a sustainable foundation. And if you look at, at the talent development, the exchange of talents to the Netherlands and back to the countries and sharing the knowledge and innovation, is a good way to look different at, at the world and not only look locally at the Netherlands, like we have a problem here and we need to solve our own problem, but we are part of a bigger thing. We are part of this whole world. And I think the international part is very important. So I always worked in a way that I don't see any borders. So, okay, I'm a citizen of the Netherlands, but I'm also a citizen of the world. So yeah, that's how we Young deal. Borders. Yeah, Very good. <laughs> exactly. And if I may ask, because I think for us it's also important to have a focus on, on international female entrepreneurship, because from the figures it says that man, many female entrepreneurs are less inclined to go international, but you are uh, going international. Uh, you say the, the world is your, uh, well, your, your uh, playground maybe. Yeah. What, what are the, the things which make it uh, difficult or not difficult as a female entrepreneur to do international business? Well, I think as a female entrepreneur, if you are more on the profit side and you are working with venture capitalists and uh, it's like hardcore business, uh, yeah, we're still in, in, yeah, it's changing a little bit by little bit, but there is still a difference between the female and the male world. And if I look at myself, for example, visiting uh, China and um, that they see me as my own intern and uh, the colleagues I bring with me who are male and in a suit, uh, or ask the questions while you are there to talk about your company. I think we still have to do a lot to change that, not only in China or the mm -hmm. rest of the world, it still counts also for the Netherlands. Uh, and who, how, how do you deal with that, with, with such an, uh, a moment in, like in China, but also if that's happening in the Netherlands? Yeah, I think it, uh, it's very difficult, but I think, like Melanie said, we have to tell the story, show the other side, uh, get... Uh, yeah, the acknowledgement that women uh, can uh, have a company and can be an entrepreneur who is working internationally and, um, yeah, profiling. And I think that's also a role for RVO uh, to have. About the, the impact of Corona on that international ambition, what has it meant to you? Yeah, when COVID started, it was uh, very bad for us because we had to uh, let all talents go back to their own country because they were closing borders. Yeah. So for five months, I think uh, it's very, it was very difficult to get them into the Netherlands and uh, have that exchange because the way we work is in the lab with new materials. So it's hands on and you can do it over the Internet. Um, did yes. you also did a, did you uh, reach out to the Dutch uh, to the Netherlands Enterprise Agency for any questions that you had or you just figured it out on your own? Yeah, we, we had contact with uh, more the European partners, like from the Solidarity yeah. Corps and um, uh, with the traineeships and the Erasmus uh, stuff. So uh, we, knew, we knew what was happening. And I think for us, it was the same as for every country uh, or company in this country. 
uh, we are still waiting. We don't know how it's moving and how it's changing, but um, uh, now it's, it's it's starting to go back and, and more international talents are coming back to the Netherlands to finish their projects. Um, the well, I think it's interesting what you said because the Netherlands Enterprise Agency itself doesn't really, is, is not able really to help in, 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 in different countries, but the embassy network is. Yeah. So often there's a lot of questions going to the embassy or the consulate general to, to find out how can we move people, what, what are the opportunities and how can we provide help when people have to go back either to the Netherlands or uh, the other way around. What would be your, your biggest advice to give to the people watching uh, when they have the ambition to, to take that international step or they're already on that first, first path? Uh, what would be the advice that you can give to them? I would say ask why. You know, if you want to be international, ask yourself why exactly do you want to be international? And, and you know, do you need to be an international and are you benefited from being international? And I think that this question is particularly relevant to international investors. When you're dealing with people locally, <laughs> you know, you're in a situation I think that's very easy to comprehend. <laughs> And I think that really makes uh, life a lot easier for you. And when these things are on your terms, <laughs> then it's much easier to do business and it makes it much easier to be successful. Great. Um, it's like a Nike, uh, <laughs> I'm just do it. Uh, that's how I work. If I need something, I contact an organization or a person, you hunt it down and you find it and, and you do it. Easy like that. <laughs> Don't overthink it. Yeah. I think those are uh, great two advices to take into the next conversation with uh, our two uh, other entrepreneurs that have both very niche-driven products and services. Uh, Melanie, Jalila, thank you so much for, for being here, for sharing your experiences and uh, your knowledge. And uh, for a little break, we have an introductionary video from our first table guest, Sabine Walbeem. Uh, so stay tuned, watch the video, and we'll We'll be right back. Ze hebben vorig jaar een prijs gewonnen, een voucher voor het Oranje Fonds. En dat is eigenlijk bedoeld als aanmoediging voor bedrijven om juist een internationaal netwerk op te bouwen of te verbreden. En Baktec doet dat ook. Zouden maatregelen wat minder zijn dan als China wat meer? Baktec is een bedrijf wat apparaten bouwt die gebruikt worden voor het bereiden van deeg en voornamelijk wordt gebruikt in bakkerijen. Ons bedrijf verkoopt onze apparaten wereldwijd, inmiddels in 65 landen. Vanuit het kabinet en ikzelf natuurlijk als minister van Buitenlandse Handel wil je juist ondernemers met internationale ambities helpen de grens over te komen. We doen dat door informatievoorziening, we contacten, we helpen netwerken opbouwen, we organiseren handelsmissies en we geven financiële ondersteuning. Maar het eerste moment is contact opnemen. Voor ons als kleine ondernemer is het heel moeilijk om uh, zo'n grote markt te gaan onderzoeken. Daar zit zoveel resources, tijd en geld in. Dat is voor ons als kleine speler niet te doen. Deelname aan het Oranje Handelsmissie voor ons heeft ons gebracht dat wij uh, hebben ons gericht op China. Uh, dat wij heel veel marktkennis hebben gekregen. Weten we daar hoe we om moeten gaan met contracten, met het beschermen van ons merk. Uh, hoe daar de markt werkt, wat de do's en don'ts zijn. Hij heeft wat dat betreft echt een heleboel deuren voor ons geopend. Los natuurlijk van de gezondheidscrisis en de economische gevolgen van corona, merken we ook dat we om weer te herstarten dingen anders kunnen doen, efficiënter en slimmer. Eén vorm daarvan is digitale handelsmissies opzetten. Die zijn laagdrempelig, goedkoop en veel meer bedrijven kunnen eraan meedoen om zo zo'n eerste verkennende stap op een nieuwe markt mogelijkerwijs te zetten. Dus bij deze ook weer een oproep. Doe mee, schrijf je in. En verken je kansen op een internationale markt, ook juist om weer de coronacrisis te boven te kunnen komen. Binnenkort starten de inschrijvingen voor het Oranje Handelsmissiefonds. Dus let op en hou de sociale media in de gaten. Welcome back. Uh, I'm here joined by Mijni Prins, the CEO of Priva Holding. Mijni, welkom. Thank you. Uh, can you tell a short what Priva Holding does? Uh, Priva is a tech company. Uh, we are active uh, in uh, climate controls, uh, 
water savings, uh, energy savings, um, with almost 500 colleagues, 16 local offices by now, 450 installation partners all over the world. Um, we uh, support and service our customers and um, with a lot of fun, of course, mm -hmm. and ambitions uh, in their field of uh, expertise. Yeah. Amazing. So you did go for world domination a bit. I did go for <laughs> world domination a little bit. Oh well, yeah, uh, partly. Yeah. <laughs> we are active in the horticulture market, and uh, indeed, there we are really active uh, in many places in the world because it's really a niche market. Eh? Until now, it's it's pretty much domain knowledge that you have to bring into that market. Uh, and the other part is the building automation. Uh, that is completely different because there are big players uh, in the building automation market. Uh, you can build up a position in the Netherlands and then you decide, okay, we have to go more international. You jump to Germany, you jump to Belgium, <laughs> you know, or you follow your customers, but that is uh, more like a commodity market. So it's very different. So it's also nice to have within one company uh, two to total different ways of you have to approach your market international. Great. And joined uh, by next to you is Sabine Welbeem, uh, the director of uh, Bucktech. We just mm -hmm. saw the video. Yeah. Uh, can you tell a little bit more uh, what Bucktech does? You explained a little already and what the uh, Orange Trade Mission Fund uh, did for you. Yeah, as already explained in the in the movie you just saw, we make appliances uh, which is mostly used for the preparations of dough and uh, those are water dosing systems and we sell those uh, worldwide to more than 60 countries. We have a large reseller network that help us do the marketing sales and the service to our equipment. And uh, we uh, found that China is a very uh, good market for us to start because uh, if you look at the Chinese population, it's more than double the population of uh, entire Europe, which is a um, uh, huge Europe number. Alone, yeah, <laughs> it's a huge number. And uh, the eating of bread, we mostly uh, uh, sell to bakeries and food industry. So the, the uh, bread is stimulated uh, by the Chinese government uh, as, uh, as food at the moment. Okay. So we see a large increase in um, industries for, in the bakery industry. So uh, for us, uh, uh, the Orange Trade Mission Fund, which helped us uh, to uh, helped us to discover the Chinese market, and uh, it's a, of course a very different market than Europe. And um, if you look at what the do's or don'ts are, the way contracts work, uh, how do you contract with uh, have a contract with a supplier? How do inform Chinese? Uh, do they inform themselves? Um, uh, those are things that. Uh, uh, really helped us and I was really amazed and surprised how much knowledge the RVO, they, we say in the Netherlands, uh, Chark, you have to <laughs> correct me on that one. Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, but I was really surprised how much knowledge they have about the local marketplace and uh, the ambassadors network and how much that helped us until now. So they really helped you to uncover the obstacles that you might face entering into that, that market. Well, certainly the knowledge of the market. And uh, we actually really had uh, a few uh, might be possible customers for the future. So, yeah. yeah. Did you perceive specific uh, obstacles or hurdles because you're a female entrepreneur or is it completely the same in those countries? Of course, there are some countries in the world uh, where it is more, did you are perceived uh, that it is more difficult. Uh, like uh, maybe Japan uh, or that people are not used to. If you go to China, I mean, China, uh, a man and a female are equal. Uh, you have as many e uh, f female CEOs than you have uh, male CEOs. doesn't matter. Eh? The, the people working on the street uh, is female or male. So, there it's, so it, of course, it depends per country. Uh, I think it's much more about the content. So what knowledge do you bring? Uh, what business do you bring? And in, in the, that is nice. Eh? Everywhere where you travel, you will find Dutch. Uh, and I think that is because the Dutch people, most of the companies are family owned, but they're also active in a niche market. 
so we are big in our niche markets, international. And that is always about content and domain knowledge. And I think that is what you bring with you. And then it doesn't matter if you are okay. female or male. And you, 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 you have been also a tr a tr uh, the, the leader of a trade mission. Yeah. Uh, one of the objectives from the, the government is to have more female entrepreneurs in trade missions. These days it's more on the virtual side, but even then. Uh, w w could you say something whether there are obstacles or reasons why fewer uh, female entrepreneurs join in a trade mission and what we could do uh, against that? I could better ask that to you, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you probably did some research on it. <laughs> no, well, no well, we, 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 we are doing research on yeah. it, but it's very difficult to really grasp what is, what is, uh, what is the reason. Could it be that it's, it's, it's too long or that it's the, the focus is, is wrong? Maybe I, I experienced why did you join? Why did you do it? Uh, at that moment, I was in the Dutch trade board, at, uh, Dutch trade in international board, uh, it's called. So uh, that was a board in the Netherlands, um, uh, pretty high, high, with, with um, representatives from from uh, entrepreneurial Netherlands. Uh, so uh, the minister Lilian Pluma asked uh, to join to Brazil. I'd never been there before, <laughs> so for me that was really uh, new. Um, and, and it was also for me the first time uh, to join because it has to be useful. Huh? So you really have to seek for something uh, to join a mission and then it's good to do because it really helps you uh, take a, an easy uh, first step. Uh, so um, I, I was not really... I, you make me think because I'm now thinking, were there female entrepreneurs joining? Yes, yeah. they were at that time. Um, but that was not the discussion, so I, I have no clue. I think for many subjects, uh, according to that topic, it's much more about how much do you, um, how do you say that, how much do you allow yourself to do? Yeah, so you have to organize things, and then you will be able, of course, to go. It's your wish, huh? it's your ambition. So uh, if you follow your mission, then you go. So you now have an office in Brazil? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet? <laughs> Not yet, no. No, my first next offices will be in Singapore for sure. Um, we're looking at the East Coast of uh, the United States, uh, to several places. And uh, so I, those two I'm uh, looking at uh, now, yeah. And, and yeah, we talked uh, yeah, the, str the struggles. What has been the biggest struggle for you, Sabine? I think to be um, to expand internationally, as I told in the movie, it's very difficult to because our market is very divided. We're in 60 countries, so to research a local market, it really costs a lot of time, energy, and resources to do that. And we're a small company, so um, it's always a risk to enter uh, that market, do the research, and um, do the investment, so, because you don't know if you, you get anything in return. So uh, if you look at the Chinese market, which of course is a large bigger, then you know, okay, we ha really have to invest. I, I really, your, your story is very familiar for me. You have to really spend a lot of time and a lot of uh, getting connected. Uh, but you know then, well, we, we have to take five years, but probably this investment is very worthwhile for us as a company. Um, but it's, it's the investment mostly in doing the market research, uh, knowing how people inform themselves in these markets, uh, how they invest their money. Well, that's m mostly the risk. The answers in the poll actually say, hey, just not knowing wh where to start or how to start and having a lack of context there. And I think that that's something that you can tell a little bit more about, Cherik, and what the, the role of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency can be in that. But also for you, Sabine, uh, the, the, the Orange Trade Mission Fund, how did you find that? Was it brought to your attention? How did that go about? Yes, it was. It, it really helps being a part of a female network. Uh, we have a few networks in the Netherlands also um, that are aimed at uh, international tr entrepreneurship. And uh, use your network, be informed, see how other people and other women or men uh, 
how they do that in the market. And of course you have the, I still call it RVO, sorry, chair. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Evo Venedex. And there's so much more uh, market information available in uh, from different banks and uh, strategic uh, companies um, that can be uh, of help to you. So I would recommend to start there. If I, if I, because I think what you yeah. say is very, very true. And I think many, many companies don't know what the government can do, be it mm -hmm. the, the embassy network or uh, because we have a very extensive embassy network who can help with different things. And the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, RVO, is also able to, to help companies when you, really, when you need more information about the market or when you need a market scan where actually they can find a, 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 a partner. We have a question about going it. into uh, if you can be as specific as possible about the measures that you have as ah, RVO. We, we, we try to be <laughs> not, not too specific on instruments, but more in broad sense. But uh, we, we have the Zaka partner scan, which is a scan which uh, will be done by uh, RVO together with the, with the embassy. And it seeks for you, for your company, a or a set of partners in a third country. Um, and it is, we can have a cold one or a warm one. And the cold one uh, gives you a list of uh, probable uh, interesting partners. And the warm one uh, gives you partners who say, I would like to be in touch with this Dutch company who could be interesting to do business with. So it's really specific measure made, made to measure for, uh, for a company. We have financial uh, opportunities with the Dutch Good Growth Fund and the Dutch Trade and Investment Fund, which is uh, well, loans for your international expansion. Um, and there is, of course, the, the, the trade missions, which become now more virtual. I think soon there will be trade missions Italy. to Italy with yeah, the minister. Yeah. And we have a, a, a lot of other instruments on the financial side. And uh, I could go <laughs> on ages on, 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 but I think that would be... <laughs> no, but I, I think also on the website, there, is a, there are search uh, opportunities where you can find exactly what could fit for you. And I think often it is forgotten that the, the government is there also for you. And You uh, mentioned in our talk before, before this... this yeah official one that you really let the customer or your client base decide where to move to next yeah but then when you when you go you you use you make use of the government uh, yeah, the, the, the embassies of the embassy yeah yeah it's always very very helpful and and good eh? good for your company because you're you're then noted too eh? so they know that you are uh, there yeah. so they know you are existing and uh, they know a little bit more about your business so they can also take that with them uh, when they when they do their work, uh, so it's very helpful to do that. Uh, also helpful for me pers personally to visit the embassies because you always learn about the latest economic developments, you learn about uh, trends, you learn about topics from governments uh, that are important for that moment, like you said. Huh? So the government decides, okay, let's do something with bread, and then <laughs> up it goes. Huh? Yeah. But in most countries, it works like that. So um, if it is about food production or, or water or energy savings, mostly it's, it's pushed by governmental rules. Uh, and then you have an opportunity to do your business. I think it's one of our challenges to, to explain to the entrepreneurs that we are there and that we can help, etc. And one of the practicalities is also we have the app, uh, NO Exporteert. Uh, which is an, an app you can just download it on, on any platform and it provides a, a map of the world where you can touch I want to go to China and you have the, the, the rules and regulations, the instruments which are available, the, the contact details of the networks of the embassy, of the consulate general, of the Netherlands Business Support yeah. Office and that worldwide in any country uh, related to the uh, opportunities for Dutch business. You can also make it well, personal for the company in what sectors are you interested, what type of uh, events are you interested. It's, um, but we have to spread it. So more people yeah. should use it, more sh people should spread the, the word that you can make use of it. Yeah. Uh, and we're trying to be active in that yeah. as well. You mentioned before and also in this talk, hey, you work within a niche. Uh, so you, you really have the, the need to, for, to survive to go international. Uh, how quickly did you do that? And Sabine, you, you already mentioned hey, the, the financial strain that it has. And I know, Mani, you have some experience with that as well. Can you elaborate a little bit more about, about that? Sometimes it's very important to have a local uh, tendency. So then you, you build up your local office. Uh, sometimes we have very good uh, uh, installation partners uh, locally, so it's not really necessary because they take good care and cover the marketplace for us uh, with their sales and their services. Um, 
Yeah, sometimes it is uh, just to decide to discover a market yourself, and then it's much more about business development. So by 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 preaching and getting contact with uh, uh, potential uh, customers, you you build up your your own marketplace. So it's it's really depending on where where do you start or how do you get uh, the idea. Some I I also think that. Um, if you are open to go international uh, as an entrepreneur uh, and you have some countries on top of your mind uh, and you you name them, words words do something. Huh? So if mm. you name it often enough, then you will see that it comes <laughs> by more and more, that you will meet people suddenly from that country or uh, so the opportunities will arise too. So it starts is, with your ambition. Isn't that just eh? Siri picking you up? Yeah. <laughs> starts with your ambition <laughs> then you speak out yeah. uh, and then suddenly something happens around you that you will make um, yeah yeah that is. But, but entering the market for for a lot of businesses uh does require some financial uh, uh meat on the bones to to be able yeah. to to build the the presence yeah. to build the and then generate start generating revenue how's yeah. that been for you is that uh it's it's a great position to be in to be able to fin finance it on your own yeah. but has it been always hey, we we enter the market we already have that big of a presence we start selling right away or do, do you need a runway or did you need a runway hmm. i um in in uh, some countries where we started indeed a local office uh, that that is quite an investment huh? to, to really start up a, an office yeah. and have people there um, mostly it starts with just one person uh, and and he starts to sell there uh, if he has like a turnover or 200,000 or 300,000 uh, euros uh, just small then you can decide, okay, maybe now it's not only sales anymore. We also add some service to it. Then you have a double team. Uh, and then from there you grow with uh, someone who's an office manager. And then uh, another service man is, is uh, added to. And, you know, that is the way you build it up. Like you normally do here too. So it starts mostly with one salesman. Yeah. Uh, and then from there you can grow uh, your marketplace. But it, you have to decide really to be, um, so you have to be very, very sure that you want to do it. Because if you enter a market uh, and you start doing business there or mention your name or, or share with people that you're there and you just leave again, <laughs> most of the time it's not very helpful when you want to return no. eh, to that. Uh, so you have to be sure upfront. So with the experiences under your belts, What's some advice you would like to, the, to give to the audience to walk away with after this session? For brief and now it's time to build up new ecosystems. So by partnering with sometimes other companies that are related to your business, but not in your own uh, chain. Yeah? So you normally you have your installation companies, but you can also have other from the same industry or even another industry that you can join uh, together. Uh, and build up from their uh, international growth. That is also very interesting. So that is like a new add-on. Uh, so uh, I would be open. That is my my uh, suggestion. So please please be open and, and think holistic from the beginning uh, to take into account so many routes that they are to go and grow international uh, and then pick out the one that feels most comfortable and most close by to start with. And then from there you can uh, go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I agree with Miney. Uh, but that's more on the personal side. Um, if I look back on the last 12 years, um, I think I had so many plans and <laughs> uh, some are still not uh, executed. And uh, I think it would be worthwhile for our company to look for funds to grow more rapidly than we have done in the last 12, 13 years. So that's one thing. And uh, of course, what we already talked about the network and uh, what that can do for you. Go to www.rvo.nl slash ondernemende vrouwen to find, the link will be in your screen as well, to find all the measures that Cherk just mentioned.